What's going on, everybody? Welcome to another edition of La Liga Insiders. A lot to break down for you guys after this weekend with Gemma Soler. And Gemma, I think we did something right because Alex Pareja is with us for this edition. We, of course, miss Rodrigo Paez. Nothing uh, against him, but we're just happy to have <laughs> Alex with us today. So let's get things started. Check out the menu of the day so you can stick around and see what to expect. Uh, yeah, Real Madrid, good in attack, bad in defense. Barca hosts Osasuna tomorrow trying to get that La Liga title and what's new with our insiders a lot to break down there for you and a very cool extra time if I do say so myself that of course involves a youngster with Barcelona who had his first chance but before we get into it let's listen to Carlo Ancelotti after Real Madrid was able to secure that 4-2 victory in La Liga against Almeria. No me entra en la cabeza que en dos partidos cuando por seis veces eh, hemos tenido portería cero, que en dos partidos hemos encajado seis goles. ¿Y ¿Qué ha pasado? Ha pasado que hemos relajado. Hoy hemos focalizado, he eh, intentado de focalizar mucho el partido en el aspecto defensivo, porque lo sé que, que en el aspecto ofensivo en este momento somos muy acertados. Es un toque de atención bueno, yo creo, porque un pequeño bajón, hemos encajado el partido de hoy dos goles. No va a pasar en los próximos partidos. Uh, yeah, he better hope that that doesn't happen for the next two matches because, uh, yeah, it's important games. Real Sociedad, they're visiting them, actually. And then they're going to have that Copa del Rey final. And then, yeah, if you guys don't remember the Champions League semifinals, I'm saying this very sarcastically because they know what's coming up against Manchester City. Uh, Alex, I, I want to start with you with what you mm -hmm. saw from this Real Madrid side and specifically what Carlo Ancelotti just said, which really jumps out, right? Two games and six goals that they've received. Uh, how much of an issue could this be for Carlo Ancelotti, not, not only in the present, but in the next few games, which I mentioned are very important? Chris, Gemma, big shout out to my evil twin, uh, Rodri, who's missing today. <laughs> um, it's, it's very important. It's massive for Carlo Ancelotti because one of the secrets of Real Madrid's success last season was balance, was balance between defense and attack and and if you're a Real Madrid fan if you're optimistic you can say oh Vinicius is on fire uh, Rodrigo is on fire as well uh, Benzema just scored three hat tricks in the span of a month uh, one of which was uh, at the Camp Nou but on the other hand um, you can tell by by watching Real Madrid games that the team has lost that balance that uh, has split up in two units the attacking unit with all those players that I mentioned, uh, and let's uh, include Marco Asensio or even Dani Ceballos, and then the defensive unit, which is formed by the four defenders and, and uh, the holding midfielder, Chouameni, Camavinga, or whoever plays in that position. And that is not good for Real Madrid, not because uh, chances of not winning Osasuna in the Copa del Rey final are fewer with, with this uh, system, which are actually fewer, but it's uh, everything in Real Madrid's perspective needs to be seen through, uh, through that uh, lens of the Champions League semi-final against Manchester City. And if you concede four goals against Girona, if you concede two goals at home against Almeria, what can you concede if you are facing a front five of Grealish, uh, Gundogan, De Bruyne, Holland? and Bernardo Silva. That's what Carlo Ancelotti is warning about, that the team needs to get back to be a compact unit and, and 11 players need to defend and 11 players need to attack. And Carletto knows that Real Madrid are losing that balance. That's why he's so insistent about defending and not conceding chances. Yeah, I'm sure uh, the Real Madrid players and even Carlo Ancelotti want to pick up the phone and say, Mikel Arteta, what happened against Manchester City? What do I have to do? Yeah, Arsenal. Let, let, me, let, let me reenact that. Mikel, how are you? I'm your good friend, uh, Carleto Ancelotti. <laughs> Remember <laughs> Something me? Something like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And, and I don't know how much time, Gemma, they have to maybe correct uh, these mistakes. But at the end of the day, something that Carlo uh, has said uh, is it only exclusive for La Liga? And I'm referring to what he said is that they've relaxed a little bit. 
Mm, it's difficult to say that. It's true that if there is a team who is able to play as Dr. Jekyll in La Liga and Mr. Hyde in the Champions League, that team is Real Madrid. But sometimes it's difficult to then to, to, to change your mindset and be able to perform 100% efficiency with efficiency mm -hmm. in the defensive line. So uh, yeah, lately I'm enjoying so much Carlo Ancelotti press conferences because he's sending big messages like when he says, I'm not going to talk about my future and keeps talking about his future so with <laughs> this thing i think he's saying something like it is okay to work on uh, karim benzema trying to to be top scorer but let's try to to be focused as well in not conceding goals because uh, this year uh, real madrid it has been one of the the, the aspects that they have uh, been less efficient than the previous years and they have lost so many points in La Liga. That's why they are in this situation uh, right now with Barcelona 11 points uh, clear and, and they have nothing to do to try to clinch the title. Um, it's difficult to change that because I think it's... I, I'm not going to only point the defensive line because uh, sometimes when, when you don't defend well, it, it's, uh, it, it's all the team's fault because if you want to do high mm -hmm. pressure, 11 players need to do that and not only the, the defensive line, but it's true that uh, maybe some players, because of injuries, because of other aspects, they haven't been uh, in, in the best version that we might have seen. And I'm thinking on Alaba, that he's still injured, mm -hmm. or the his performances have not been that uh, that great. Uh, Militao still is doubtful for, for tomorrow, so it's it's not easy. Uh, that, but but I think it's, it's a matter of psychology. And uh, I think that against Almeria, they they kind of relaxed when they were 3-0, when they were beating a rival uh, that's struggling to avoid relegation and also with the substitute players because they were thinking on their final in the next match day. Uh, so I think it's it's human and uh, Carlo Ancelotti wants to wake up the, the players of that uh, snap that they took against Almeria and, and make them uh, notice that they cannot do this in, in a final against Osasuna and of course not in the semi-finals of the Champions League. Yeah, and on that humanity side uh, that Gemma was just mentioning, uh, Alex, I mean, it, it's true, right? It, it, there's a lot of things to balance here with Karim Benzema and that individual kind of goal that he has uh, as well, but also the title race. It looks very far for La Liga. They have this Copa del Rey possibility. Uh, they have this Champions League that we were just talking about. So how can Carlo Ancelotti balance this and really look to his players that maybe don't get as much playing time to really shine when they can in La Liga where they've seemed quote-unquote relaxed. It's a very delicate balance and this is why Carlo Ancelotti is one of the best managers in the world because he can he can achieve that. He can uh, tell their players, hey, we need to wake up and they can turn on that switch that, that uh, actually uh, currently now is off. Um, it's, it's a very delicate balance because there's a lot of distractions that you mentioned. It's uh, Benzema's individual race with Karim Benz uh, with uh, Robert Lewandowski for the top uh, scorer uh, award. It's uh, not finishing in third place because Atletico de Madrid are pushing from behind and they're relentless. They only lost to Barcelona in the second leg. Yeah. Uh, there's that Copa del Rey final that everyone takes for granted against Osasuna and that could be a huge disappointment for them especially right before playing Manchester City in the Champions League semi-finals to lose against uh, Osasuna who are clearly uh, the underdogs on that Copa del Rey final so but if anyone can do that if anyone can flip that switch again is Carlo Ancelotti because players really believe in him, players uh, really admire him, and they listen to him. And that's the difference between Carlo Ancelotti and, for instance, Rafa Benitez, a former, or Julio Lopetegui, former Real Madrid managers that ne they never get to, got to connect with, with players. This is different. Uh, Carlo Ancelotti is the leader of this dressing room, and he is trying to shake a little bit the cage before uh, there's a first disappointment this, this weekend at uh, Real Sociedad, at uh, Osasuna. But before that, there's a huge demand in game at uh, San Sebastián against uh, Real Sociedad. So it's not an easy solution. It's not an easy situation for Carlo Ancelotti to be in, but that's why you are getting paid and that's why you are the Real Madrid manager because you need to take care and you need to deal with uh, delicate and tough situations like uh, the one that Real Madrid are facing right now.
Yeah, let's talk about that game that you just mentioned, uh, Alex. Of course, you said a mm -hmm. big visit. It's very, very complicated when anybody visits Real Sociedad. That's a credit, of course, uh, to them and what they're trying to achieve uh, this season, of course, uh, get back to uh, their European ways. But Gemma, where can this game be the most complicated for Carlo Ancelotti and company? Well, I think it's uh, difficult in, in everything because uh, Imanol Alguacil's squad is uh, one of the teams who has uh, been playing better football in the Spanish mm -hmm. La Liga. They are very efficient. They, they work like a team. They are a, a team that maybe they don't have that many shiny individualities, but they, they work well and, and they are in a, in a good streak and they keep uh, have to do, do these uh, good results because uh, they want to play the Champions League next season. They are in the verge to do it, but they cannot uh, uh, relax. And they know they also have a good opportunity um, in, in front of a home crowd to beat Real Madrid, to beat the big teams at their stadium in a, in a season that it's been really successful. It's, uh, it's like a press and a gift for their fine base. So I think they are very intense. And in the, in, the, in the question of who wants to win more that game, it can be that Real Sociedad uh, really push more or put more uh, physicality there to beat uh, Real Madrid. That Madrid that they will be thinking on Copa del Rey on Champions League and, and maybe they don't want to have any kind of accident, injury and, and so on. So I, I think it has a lot of uh, dangerous situations. If uh, Real Madrid they want to, to leave Real Arena not being too much damage uh, with a result, they will have to, to play uh, very intense and to be especially very focused, not making mistakes in the in the defense. And otherwise, I think it's a it's a dangerous uh, game for for Carlo Ancelotti. And dynamics are really important in football. So even though they are thinking a lot on Copa del Rey, uh, being in, in arriving in that final with a really bad result in the previous match, never mm -hmm. good. Yeah, absolutely, especially mm -hmm. at this point, especially when you see your biggest rival in La Liga uh, running away with the title at this moment. They still need eight points. Speaking of, uh, and before we get to that, we do want to remind everybody that you can watch this Real Madrid match, of course, against Real Sociedad on Tuesday at 3.55 p.m. Eastern on the ESPN Plus app. Sign up now. What are you waiting for? You don't want to miss a second of the action, especially when we're talking about the last few games of the season. Speaking of, uh, Barcelona seemed to not really have an issue uh, with uh, Real Betis. That was a little bit disappointing. They played with 10 men for most of the match, minute 32 around there. And it was kind of a perfect day for Barcelona. Uh, let's see what Xavi Hernandez, of course, uh, said about uh, his squad. A reaction was needed and it's been good after a deserved defeat in Vallecas. We needed to react. I've been convinced by what I've seen. Now we play again at home. I have good feelings towards the title. As I just mentioned, Alex, they only need eight points. Uh, what do you think of what Xavi is saying about this reaction that they were able to have after that complicated match? Well, you before? You, you need to bounce back after a defeat, and that's exactly what Barcelona did after the poor image that they left at Vallecas against Rayo Vallecano. Uh, that being said, uh, the game, as you mentioned, uh, Chris, uh, finished, ended uh, when Edgar was uh, sent off with a second yellow card. This is when Betis collapsed, and it was too easy for Barcelona. You can't, you can't um, assess the level of the team based on this specific game because Betis were playing with 10 men, then Joaquin uh, entered the pitch and got injured. So it was a disaster day for, for Betis and everything went well for, for Barcelona. Rafinha completed an amazing game just the day that uh, Ousmane Dembele was back. It, believe it or not, this can be, uh, it can be a coincidence or not. Um, Sergio Busquets and Frankie de Jong, you, you can tell of Barcelona, that system with the four midfielders only work perfectly when uh, the four midfielders that are meant to play in that system are healthy. So when Busquets and de Jong are sharing uh, their position a little bit deeper and when Gabi and Pedri are right behind Lewandowski. This is when Barcelona can express their, their best uh, football. Uh, Rafinha had a great game attacking, making runs into the space instead of 
uh, getting the ball in wide areas and trying to take on players, uh, the, the eruption of Lamin Yamal in the second half, uh, even the, the move by Ansu Fati in the fourth goal. Ansu Fati needs to start showing back his skills, his change of pace, uh, the things that made him special before he got injured. So, yeah, if we consider that, uh, Barcelona had a great game against Betis, but we cannot forgive that Betis were playing with 10 men from minute 30 on, and this is too much when you're playing at the Camp Nou, and when you're playing against an inspired side, uh, which, which is what Barcelona was uh, last Saturday. Yeah, and Gemma, how were they feeling with those players that were able to finally come back like Guzman Dembélé? Well, as uh, Alex mentioned, a lot of the arguments that may, that converted that that game on an almost perfect game for for Barcelona, and and especially uh, being able to see Usman Dembélé back, a player that they have been missing him so much, especially Xavi. He never hides that he's one of his favorite players. He missed so much his impredictability, his one on one. So yeah, he's back to the squad after missing 17 match days and uh, he looked uh, fit. Also Andreas Christensen, they have been missing yep. him in the back as well and he just needed one chance to, to score the goal and then adding the fact that um, Frankie de Jong and Pedri, we, we saw him them uh, being back with the squad but they needed a little bit of uh, competitive level and, and against Betis, I, I, I will add, I will highlight what Alex was saying, it's difficult to judge a game where you play against a team with one man down since minutes, I think, what, 15 or something like that. So it's it's um, it's difficult to, to judge that, but it was almost a perfect day. And then it had that, it was like, it became almost a party that they come now. It's true that the weather was awful because it rained cats and dogs, <laughs> but uh, people had a lot of fun because they were clapping. It became, I mean, it was clear that Barcelona was going to win that game. Uh, game, it will, it will be a comfortable victory. But then when Dembélé went to warm up, clapping, uh, when uh, Lamin Yamal went to do the warm up, another party. Then when uh, Dembélé uh, came in the field, let's celebrate again, then Lamal again and again. So it was like a big party. Then Joaquin, uh, the Camp Nou also clapped a lot for for the eternal captain of uh, Betis. Then they clapped again when he got injured. So it, it became like a, a fun victory <laughs> for Barcelona. And I think that they recovered feelings because they they did needed to win and convince because what Barcelona cannot do is to clinch La Liga title, but feeling like uh, they don't deserve it. They, they want to show mm -hmm. that they, they are the best team in this La Liga and, and they have to do this with performances like the one before against Betis. Yeah, they don't want to walk away uh, with the title. They want to run away and far and not feel like Real Madrid is going to, uh, at the last second, just grab them <laughs> at the ankles. I do want to say it was raining uh, cats and dogs and goals, but Gemma, your Instagram versus reality, I didn't see a difference. <laughs> you always look great. <laughs> and, and it was a very rain. much needed rain. It was a very much needed rain in Barcelona. Yeah, yeah. Can tell. Well, there's, a, yeah. there's a massive drought over there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm happy it rained, even though my hair looked like hell, but it's okay. <laughs> oh, <laughs> come on. Gemma, we've, we've all been there. Us three here understand. All, the all, all of us. All we of understand. Us. <laughs> of course, uh, good, good gel and uh, just a good uh, slick back. But anyway, we're getting uh, off topic. Staying on uh, what Barcelona needs to do, of course, in these next uh, couple of games, Alex, they face Osasuna. Um, maybe thinking about, of course, Osasuna, what's coming up for them, uh, that Copa del Rey final. What version of Osasuna can Barcelona expect? Uh, the most alternative version possible. So all the important players of Osasuna will be resting, getting ready for that uh, Copa del Rey final. Osasuna already did their job. They're, they're uh, guaranteed to play in Primera División for next season. And this is the most important game of the club's history since the other Copa del Rey final that they played in 2005 against the Betis. Everyone in Pamplona is thinking about that and everyone in Pamplona doesn't care at all about the game at the Camp Nou. It's as simple as that. So you should expect another party at the Camp Nou, as Gemma referred to. Uh, and you should expect some rotations uh, and some some alternatives from from Xavi. Uh, we're talking about the style of Barcelona in this 
last uh, weeks of the competition, they need to turn on the style for one more reason, if you think about it. The next season, uh, Barcelona are going to play at the Luis Companys in Montjuic. It's not an accessible stadium. Uh, there won't be uh, much, uh, many seats available for, for the socios, for the partners. And Barcelona uh, should use these last weeks of, of this La Liga season to become the best advert advertising possible, the best mm -hmm. uh, campaign possible for dragging the socios, the dragging the fans to Montjuic. So it's it's a matter of uh, showing their style and showing what they're able to do next season. So it's like, if you like our soccer, uh, it doesn't matter if we don't play at Camp Nou, come with us to Montjuic because you're going to have fun. And this year, to be honest, fans of the Camp Nou didn't have much fun. Uh, they, they saw their team winning a lot of games. They saw their team conceding a few goals, just a couple of goals at the Camp Nou, but they're not having the kind of fun that they were having under Guardiola or under Luis Enrique. And this is the kind of style that they need to get back in order to make that, the style of play, the best advertising campaign for dragging socios to the Stadio Olympic of Montjuic. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the socios, of course, that we know that a lot of tourists go exclusively to, to yeah. see uh, the Barcelona match. Uh, which is going to be a part of what they have to just look forward to, of course, next season. And what they have to look forward to uh, in the next couple of matches, Gemma, is hopefully uh, clinch the title. What mentality should they have going into this Osasuna match, uh, apart from these rotations that Alex was already mentioning? Um, I think the mentality is the same that they show against Betis, that they cannot relax as they did in, in Vallecas and, and, and they played an, an awful game, one of the worst of the, the season. They, they have a, a lot of things to, to win apart from uh, La Liga title. Marc André Ter Stegen can beat uh, yet uh, more records. He's going to be the, the Zamora Prize uh, goalkeeper with less uh, goals considered for sure. But there are other records that he can work on. Also, the, the defensive line can keep on uh, showing that the, the, their strength. Uh, the, the, and then in the forward line, of course, Lewandowski will be looking for uh, becoming the top scorer, the Pichichi on La Liga. Dembele, uh, he needs to, to show that uh, his first version that we saw before his injury uh, is, is back and that he can keep on showing that the next year. And then other uh, little prizes for the fan base, like being able to, to see again uh, Lamin Yamal. It's, we kind of uh, expect uh, something big from, from this kid, 15 year old, but it was very surprising to see how brave is him. Uh, it's again difficult to judge uh, with uh, playing against a team that they were so exhausted. They were uh, two men down at that point when fucking couldn't mm -hmm. uh, continue. But he was so brave to try to score, try to assist, <laughs> and and it, it, so I think Barcelona need to keep this uh, winning mentality. I think Chavi is working a lot on that. As as I mentioned uh, on the Clásico, they felt that they they won La Liga. The Atletico Madrid win. I could listen to the shouts in the locker room. They were shouting <laughs> as they really won La Liga that day. And then five seconds later, Xavi said, we haven't won anything. So I think... Gemma, Gemma, were, were they singing campeones, campeones or not? Were they singing uh, that or not? No, not that <laughs> word. Not that word, but, but they were like, ah, with a lot. because Pretty close, right? La, <laughs> if if they were... They were yeah. spelling nerves and, 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 and showing that you, you don't listen to this every day. So it, no. they knew it was an important win, those three points. If they were singing Campeones, Campeones, I would hope it was yeah. towards the, the women's team that already secured, of yeah. course, yeah. The, the, La Liga, the La Liga title. <laughs> and that, that they were yeah. able to, uh, to, of course, show off. Uh, Yama, quickly, Yamal, the youngest in Barcelona's history, correct, to, to debut? Yes, uh, he's uh, 15 years, uh, 200 and something. Now he's going to be 16 years old on, on July. So he's uh, the youngest. And, and to wow. put a little context on, on that, uh, Gabi was uh, a year and a half older. Uh, Antipati was a year older when they did their debut. So it's something historical and, and very surprising. Uh, Xavi himself uh, recognized that uh, he couldn't do that in with 15 years that uh, 
Lamal is much more uh, mature. And I think it's something related to society. I think these kids are way, everything goes faster. And, and he showed that uh, mm -hmm. in, in, in the field. Uh, it's, yeah, it's uh, the next gem to La Masia, but let's not put tax like the new Messi, the new, because it's putting yes. a lot of pressure in someone mm -hmm. that he's still wearing braces and he's a kid going to yeah. school. First. Yeah, good Good on you, kiddo. Uh, Alex, you want to say something about uh, Yamal before we move on? No, no, no. I, I could only repeat what Gemma just said. I mean, he's 15, he's a prodigy, but we got to be careful. How many players have we seen uh, just breaking through when they're super young and then nobody remembers them when they're 20, 21? So we got to be very careful. I've seen a few, uh, especially at the Camp Nou. I could talk you about Babangida, Gaia Sulin, Jeffrey Suarez. We've seen a lot of players that seemed to be the next big thing and then disappeared. Like Mario Rosas, I, I played against, uh, when I was, when I was uh, playing uh, in, in youth system, I played against Barcelona a few times. I played for Barcelona and then I played against them. And I played against Xavi, against Gerard Lopez, against a lot of players that finally made it to Primera División and became superstars. But I also played against players like Mario Rosas, who was regarded as the biggest talent uh, in La Masia back in the day. And when Xavi and, and Gerard Lopez were part of that team, and Mario Rosas never made it to the first team, never, never had a career in Primera División because it's so difficult. It's so difficult. There's a saying in, in Barcelona or in Spanish, lo difícil no es llegar, lo difícil es mantenerte. So, so yeah. breaking through, getting there is not the hardest part. The hardest part is staying there. And, and that's exactly what we just saw. We just saw the, the tip of the iceberg. But La Minya Mal's career, should last for maybe twice his age right now. So, yeah. so we need Hopefully. to be very careful. Hopefully. Uh, yeah, we, we got ahead of ourselves and I, I blame myself right mm. there because this was our extra time. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, we'll, got, we'll call this- I got this, a book to recommend. Yeah, recommend. We'll, we'll call this all our extra time, but it's our little um, half time maybe to take us to our insider information. It's, just, it's really exciting to see somebody so young, but that excitement needs to be treated, of course. <laughs> Uh, with with the the extra care, of course, that that is needed for somebody so young. All right, let, let's take it to our insider information. Uh, Gemma, I'm going to start with you because uh, speaking of someone who is young, of course, and getting that experience is uh, is Vinicius Junior. Uh, what's going on with him and and the referees? It seems like in every match he's uh, having kind of a uh, debating match with the refs. Yeah, and there is a big debate in Spain, in Spain regarding Vinicius and the referees. And it's a debate with two completely different opinions. One is Real Madrid, that they are defending Vinicius. Let's remember that he saw the 10th yellow card, so he will, will be booked for that game at the Real Arena. This is a big number, 10 uh, yellow cards in a in a season. It's a uh, it's it's a big number. A lot of these uh, yellow cards are for uh, talking to the referee. He did again uh, that in in the game against Almeria. And as I was saying, the debate uh, you could see just after seeing that yellow card, Benzema goes to the referee and say, "Why? Why you show him? Um, it was the first time he talked to you." And but this is a yellow card to 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 do what Vinicius uh, did. This is uh, a yellow card. But if you talk to anyone at Madrid, the the what they think is that uh, Vinicius is the victim. How is it possible that? The player in La Liga who received the more falls is one of the players with more yellow cards. Uh, Ancelotti, today he was asked, uh, maybe he needs to see a red card because he was, has been never uh, been sent off um, yet. In Primera División, he saw that when playing with Real Madrid Castilla in a game, but never in first uh, division. Uh, and Ancelotti was somehow out felt outraged, like, no, how can you say that? So the... the position of Real Madrid will be always defending Vinicius and the rest of the society or the football world uh, is like there is a kind of permission to, to Vinicius because a lot of players are being sent off for uh, talking and complaining to the referee over and over again and and the the rivals or the rest of the of the football they they think that uh, there is some kind of um, permissivity with Vinicius because uh, somehow the referees are a little bit afraid of uh, uh, 
showing a red card to Vinicius because it brings so much media attention, it could be a <laughs> problem for that uh, referee. So there is a huge debate. What uh, we've been told is that Real Madrid is not going to change the position, that they will always defend uh, with everything they got with the media uh, machine and everything. Uh, Vinicius, I want to think that uh, inside uh, the locker room, Ancelotti, who is a very wise and expert uh, coach, he will be talking to Vinicius because um, it's true that he loses the nerve. If you watch the game against Almeria, it's true that he received uh, a couple of uh, falls, but those are a lot of them are normal falls that any forward uh, receives, and and he was already a start being too much nervous, uh, the gestures and and the things that it can become a problem for him and especially for his his team because if this is a yellow card, of course he plays in a different way and and it can become a, a problem for for Real Madrid. Yeah, and I think it's a good time for him to kind of learn that lesson because he's still so young and all of that comes with experience. It's not only about how you play, but how you conduct yourself, of course. And we know it's been complicated for him with, and we've talked about it here before, with situations going on uh, outside of, of course, of what the realm of, of football should be. Uh, so I do try to be very empathetic with him and, of course, trying to just handle those situations. But we'll see how Carlo Ancelotti, if anybody can handle it, of course, it's Carlo Ancelotti and that community communication that he's able to have with his players like that communication Alex that he's able to have with someone like Karim Benzema uh, talk to us about yep. this new Karim now Oof, uh, I will just say let the rumors begin because uh, today Carlo Ancelotti the press conference prior to that game against Real Sociedad admitted that Real Madrid should look for a number nine should look for a striker for next season. He talked about Karim Benzema. He said, oh, Karim is a fantastic player. He's in a great form. But we've seen that, that he, he has a certain age already and he's not going to get any younger. So we need an, a new number nine. So let the rumors begin because you, can, you will start hearing from Mbappe rumors again and any kind of number nine that, that is flying around Europe. Are, are, is going to be linked with uh, Real Madrid, and but I think this is something that Real Madrid really needs. Uh, I understand that, that Karim Benzema is the the sole number nine of the team. Uh, he is uh, well, the captain. He's one of the best players ever for uh, having played for for Real Madrid. But it's the circle of life, and they tried to have a, a replacement or or a competitor with Jovic. It didn't work out. They try to have a competitor with Mariano and it didn't work out either, but they need to look for a reliable number nine because sadly, but, but it's, this is a circle of life, Benzema is going to start to fade out eventually and they need to be ready for, for a replacement. But that being said, if, if Carlo Ancelotti admits that, you can expect now uh, the internet is going to blow up with with all the candidates to become Real Madrid's next number nine over the over the next uh, month. It's going to be a, a nightmare for for journalists because of that because they're going to link a thousand players with Real Madrid. Of course, oh, yeah. of course. And just off the top of my head, I'm thinking Harry Kane uh, again with the situation and, and the Spurs yeah, and the way Spurs uh, situation. Uh, You're right. Yeah. Yeah, uh, and Love that's just one of many. One. Yeah. Because even you mentioning that, I'm like, okay, wait, who's available that could go to them? But, yeah. See, see, that that's <laughs> part of the rumors. <laughs> <laughs> and it's so interesting. Uh, Gemma, I'll take it back to you. Let's go back to Barcelona. Uh, you talked about Grisenson, of course, being back. And uh, what does that have to do, of course, with now uh, Jules Kunde? Yeah, well, I, I, I will say that one is the yin and the other one is the yin. Because it, the truth is that the situation of these two players are almost opposite. Uh, for Christensen, uh, everything is uh, being good after being back from injury scoring. And especially with Xavi highlighting the, the role of the Danish uh, um, player, saying something that usually he doesn't say, saying, he was my signing, like uh, putting credit on him. What does it mean that the rest of the players my boy. were your signing? <laughs> Exactly, because uh, the position for Xavi is like, I know the club is in an economical, critical situation, but this is my guy. I'm gonna, I want to protect my guy. I want to protect my signing. It was my boy, so please don't sell him. Because Xavi is aware that the, the, the fact that uh, Christensen's uh, performance was so good, that the good understanding that he has, especially with Araujo, also with Ter Stegen, it's not easy to have a, a new forward line, and a defensive line, and they managed to 
to communicate so well uh, inside and outside the, the pitch. And I think it's one of the, the greats of these good numbers of Barcelona in, in defence. Uh, so everything is good with Christensen because also he was a player who arrived at the Camp Nou as a free agent. Uh, so mm -hmm. this is all good for this player. Uh, the fan base were not expecting that much from this player. So he's one of the heroes now. What's happening with Kunde? The, the fact that he, he was already a consolidated player in Liga, that he cost a lot of money uh, to, to Barcelona, and the fact that he was okay since uh, there was, uh, let's remember that he couldn't play the first game because of the registering problems that Barcelona were facing. He played, he has been playing well. His numbers are okay, but are not brilliant for a player that costs so, many, so much money. And there is another factor that uh, he wants he wants to play as a central defender but the, the what Xavi needs him is uh, on the full back on the right full back and his performance on that uh, position um, have been fading out a little bit on, on the last games and actually the body language of the player sometimes is a little bit of a frustrate frustration he started that game where Sergio Roberto got injured playing as a, a central defender and he needed to, to be changed because of that. And, and the thing is that Barcelona doesn't have a, a natural player for that position. Uh, Sergio Roberto is injured, Bellerin's operation didn't work. So there is a lot of frustration in this player, but also in the club because they know the situation is not uh, the, the best and uh, Xavi needs to, to work on that and trying to to maintain the to, to get back to his uh, best performances because thinking on next season they want to uh, do other operations we will be taking uh, talking a little bit later on and and they need this player at a hundred percent fit and motivated of course yeah absolutely and the numbers will really dictate who stays and who goes not only mm -hmm. the numbers that they're seeing on the field but of course those uh, little numbers in their economic and their financial situation. Uh, Alex, back to you, because uh, speaking of, of rumors, not only with Benzema, but of course with Carlo Ancelotti, and that's been kind of this big question, right? Will he stay? Mm -hmm. Will he go? What does the time like look like with him, not only with Real Madrid, but of course this interest that we've seen before from the Brazilian national team? That is yet another of the distractions that we were talking about, uh, the, the surroundings of, of Real Madrid, uh, the future of Carlo Ancelotti. He still got a, a, an extra year. His contract uh, runs out in 2024, but there's rumors about an interest from uh, the Brazilian national team to sign him. And apparently we need to keep an eye on May the 25th. That could be that apparently, according to the rumors, is the deadline that Carlo Ancelotti has to say yes or no to the alleged uh, proposal of uh, the Brazil national team. Uh, Carreto Ancelotti said in today's press conference that that is not true, that, that uh, he's going to stay at Real Madrid no matter what. But that May the 25th date uh, is right after the Champions League tie against uh, Manchester City. So what if, what if? Real Madrid don't win the Copa del Rey against Osasuna and what if they get knocked out uh, by Manchester City, the, 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 the landscape, the scenery could change dramatically for, for Carlo Ancelotti when it comes to his chances of staying at Real Madrid one more year. So uh, he says that there is no such a thing as a deadline, but we need to keep an eye on May the 25th because according to rumors, this is the date when Carlo Ancelotti should decide, should play that old The Clash song. Should I stay or should I go? <laughs> <laughs> and that's what Real Madrid fans are singing right now. And every time they see Carlo Ancelotti, will he stay? Will he go? We do not know. We have to wait just a few more weeks. Uh, speaking of will he stay and where will he go, Gemma, what's the latest with Lionel Messi? Well, I quote uh, Alex as he was uh, referring to a very popular song. I, I put that uh, headline with uh, Lionel Messi situation is working yeah. on a dream because uh, not only because the Spring Team did his first uh, um, show with Geek in, in Barcelona, but because what Barcelona are trying to perform right now is working a lot in the uh, offices in the board of members are getting crazy to try to to make this possible uh, what we can add here is that uh, they have already 
work in the proposal for La Liga because before sending Messi any kind of proposal, they need to know that this is right and it will work and they cannot make the same mistake they did two years ago. And the information we have, uh, it's that it's not being easy to, to reach an agreement uh, with La Liga because there is uh, these uh, things that they think different when talking about financial fair play. They need to reduce the, the salary cap about 200 million euros. This is not easy. So they are working on that number, those numbers to be able to, to uh, fit uh, Lionel Messi in that financial fair play. Uh, it's true that the situation of uh, Lionel Messi in, uh, in in Paris is getting every every year, every match, every day a little bit more more difficult. But of course, if Barcelona are not able to to put a, a, a good uh, um, offer uh, in on the table, it's it's difficult to to think on that uh, dream coming true. There are still a lot of weeks, months, uh, Christina Alex, that we will have to. To talk about but if, if, if you ask me today i'm not that much optimistic sometimes it depends on the day hmm. sometimes uh, it depends on who you talk to they send you another kind of uh, message but what i've received uh, this uh, these last few days is that it's getting difficult that the agreement with la liga is still not done let's let's give them a, a couple of more days weeks and and see how how it goes uh, how it goes because really they are working on on that dream that is i think it's a dream for everyone it's a dream for barcelona for la liga for lionel messi and for fans of football in general mm -hmm. we need to create we need to create a playlist for this episode because we yeah. can say <laughs> that both messi and barcelona are living on a prayer right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love it. I love it. Let's let's start uh, writing it down because Messi will run run so far away from uh, PSG, baby, soon. <laughs> he was born to run. He was born to run, <laughs> Messi. Uh, he really was, and to score goals and to be a uh, historic man. I love I, I love the idea of that. Uh, I'm going to talk to the producer after because I think that's actually a really, really good idea. Uh, Alex, I'll I'll stick with you. Um, uh, let's talk about Valladolid because somebody wasn't very happy about the refereeing around Atletico de Madrid. Yeah, yesterday I, I was commenting uh, Real Valladolid Atletico de Madrid uh, with, with Mark Donaldson, with uh, my friend Marquisio, and there was a penalty. There was a penalty of, or a penalty claim for Valladolid. Uh, Valladolid were two, three down at that moment uh, in the first minute of the game, and there was a handball by, by Saúl Níguez. Uh, the VAR didn't intervene, uh, the penalty wasn't awarded to Valladolid, and Atletico de Madrid uh, ended up winning 2-5. So this is the latest controversy because I think that it was a clear handball, and I said so uh, when I was commenting on that game. But the problem at this point with, with handballs in, in Spanish uh, football is that there's a lack of, of consistency when it comes to applying the same criteria to, to the similar place and everyone is uh, very confused right now about when the, it's a handball and when it's not and and uh, Oscar Puente uh, by Adolid's uh, mayor uh, was on a rant on Twitter yesterday and I can't say what what he wrote down on, on Twitter uh, because I don't want to be banned but uh, <laughs> he was complaining he was complaining about the lack of criteria and and how could that not be a, a handball and he was complaining about that, using harsh words uh, against the Spanish uh, refereeing uh, for, for this. It's like uh, the VAR only works for big clubs. Uh, mm. for When it comes to us, when it comes to small fish like Valladolid, uh, the VAR only exists for uh, ignoring us. This is basically, uh, in a nutshell, what, what Oscar Puente, the mayor of Valladolid, uh, said on Twitter about the VAR uh, yesterday. because. He's got a point, he's got a point. The refereeing this season, when it comes to handball in Spain, uh, has been very, very confusing. Yeah, absolutely. And, and it's the, the kind of, I don't know, I'm hearing the words of, of Ancelotti, right? That they don't want little penalties, of course, being called uh, in every game. Penaltitos. So. Penaltitos, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, little, uh, little, little penalties that, of course, uh, every club has seen. But yeah, maybe the, the bigger clubs have seen. It's it's a tough situation. Uh, Gemma, Alex, since I got ahead of myself, we don't have extra time <laughs> anymore. No. Yeah. Uh, with, with yeah, with uh, with the kiddo that we were talking about. I mean, we just got really excited about the fact that we saw history on. Ah, uh, yeah. Being yeah, and I must say. 
Yeah, I've got a suggestion for him. I've got a suggestion for, for La Milla Mal. Uh, this is a yeah. book called ¿Sí? Football B. Uh, it's written by Jacinto Ela. Gemma knows uh, yeah. perfectly who Jacinto is. He was regarded when he was 14. Jacinto uh, is kind of the Spanish Freddy Adu. He was regarded as the best oh. U14 player in the world. He was way younger than me when, when we faced off. Uh, and then he signed for Southampton. Uh, did you ever hear, Cristina, about Jacinto Ela? Just no, no right? Mm -hmm. you, you don't know who he is because he never made it to the first team. And, and in this book, he, it's his uh, soccer memoir. And, and all, the, all that young players should need, uh, should need to know before they, they step into this cruel world that, that soccer is. So I would recommend Lamin Yamal this. Uh, Football Bay by Jacinto Ela. Look, look him up on, on Google Jacinto. Uh, he now works uh, as, a, as an educator in, in a school and he's a lesson of life, uh, Jacinto Ela. So all those players that are meant to be the next big thing and never make it to Primera División, there's an alternative. And, and this is a warning for all those players, for players like Lamin Yamal, that despite being pointed out that the next Messi, the next Maradona, the next whatever, uh, yeah. there's always a risk of being left out. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. And just trying to not suffer from that comparison and just mm -hmm. focus on the player that they want to be and that they want to make a, a name for themselves. It's it's a very interesting uh, read, it seems to be, uh, Alex, of course, that, mm -hmm. with that a great recommendation. And we are responsible to be uh, careful in how we handle these mm -hmm. youngsters, of course, being yep. on such a big international stage. And we see it, of course, not only exclusively in Spain. I've seen it happen in Mexico, of course, with all the potential in the world. There was one kid who scored two goals in one game and everybody was calling him. Uh, Freddy Adu. Freddy Adu, of course. I, I remember him perfectly. And, and yeah, it was mm -hmm. only just a, a short period of time. So let's hope that the story that we just saw this weekend has uh, a more successful ending or has a prolonged career, of course, as a professional footballer. Gemma, Alex, thank you so much. I love to remind everybody who watches us to follow uh, these two on their social media, of course, with the latest and greatest. Uh, if you're a big music <laughs> fan, uh, give Alex Pareja, of course, uh, a follow. Uh, as you've already <laughs> noticed, yeah, he loves he loves this music and we love that you bring it here to the segments. And you can watch all of La Liga matches on ESPN+. Plus. He's about to go get something. I know him. Yeah. <laughs> my guitar. One of my guitars. One of my girlfriends. <laughs> oh wow! Such a beauty. Such a beauty. <laughs> next, next league in Sunday, insiders, you need to finish with some notes. Yeah, or we need, maybe... to, we need to negotiate the, the rights, the music rights, because oh. I can write uh, new stuff. So <laughs> I, I have it. a microphone yeah. somewhere, so maybe we can do some uh, sort of uh, karaoke. I'm sorry for our listeners, but we can do that on the crazy last team. Let's, Let's do that. Let's do that for the next classical. I'll do percussion with my hands. Okay. <laughs> Gemma, Alex, <laughs> great stuff as always. Thank you so much. And we'll talk to you guys Thank in a you. few days with new results from Barcelona, from Real Madrid, and of course, the shift in La Liga. See you next time.